This morning we are going to be in the book of Hebrews. So you better have your Bibles and uh, start turning to the book of Hebrews on your phone or pad or Bible. Do not check your Facebook status. <laughs> you know who I'm talking to, John Chatham. <laughs> the book of Hebrews contrasts the Old Testament system of the law and the New Testament system of grace. And it shows how the Jewish system was temporary and how Christ's system improved upon that covenant. And throughout this book, you will come across three main words that are used by the author to give this comparison, or rather this contrast, and um, you're going to see that it's better, eternal, and perfect, or uh, what I'd like to call complete, or fulfilled. In other words, this doesn't mean that the book of Hebrews speaks in a way about the Old Testament as if we are to throw out the Old Testament and not have to adhere to the laws like the Ten Commandments. That is not what Jesus came to do, and it's not uh, biblically accurate. Uh, if you recall the conversation that Jesus had, he said, I have not come to abolish the law, but he says, I've come to fulfill it. So to make it more uh, uh, fulfilled or filled up like a, like a glass that's only partially filled, Jesus said, I've not come to dump it out. I've come to give you a better picture to fill that baby up, to let you know. I can say baby, right? I can do that. At times, or at the time of Hebrews, or that the book of Hebrews was being written, Jesus, uh, Jewish Christians were going through a, a tough time, and they were being persecuted, and there was this temptation to say, you know what, this Christian faith or this Christian religion really isn't working out, because look at all the persecution we're facing. We, you know, maybe it's just better that we go back to the old way, to the Jewish law, to the Old Testament law, and just try to keep the law. What they failed to understand was the reason Jesus came was that no one could fulfill the law and become saved. Under the law, no one was righteous. The law showed us that we were sinners. The law really was a mirror that reflected our image. And what that image was is that it showed us that we were sinful, that we were dirty, that we were in need of something that we could not clean ourselves with. That's what the Old Testament law did. And what Jesus said, I've come to fulfill that. I've come to satisfy the law. Are you with me? Can I hear an amen anywhere? Anybody, anybody with me? Yes. All right, Just make sure you haven't fallen asleep yet. I love a song um, that was during the Welsh revival of the turn of the, the 19 or the 1900s, there, right at the turn of the century. Uh, and in it, um, it's it's called "Here Is Love," and in it, it says, "Heaven's peace and perfect justice kiss a guilty world in love." You see, the Old Testament showed the law of what a holy God requires. The Old Testament showed that you and I could not fulfill, could keep the law, because we are born with a sinful nature. We are born bent towards sin, and we have sin, and thus the, the sin that we have has separated us. And if left in our sins, we die, right? The, the punishment for sin is death. However, the grace of God came down in the form of Jesus, and it met God's justice. Because just as much as we love to talk about God's love, what God is also is just. And 
Jesus fulfilled God's justice on Calvary. There was a amen right there. I mean, that's the that's the whole crux of the gospel. And and, and that's why I love that song where grace, uh, um, where heaven's peace, the Prince of Peace, met justice and grace and grace won over death. That's what the Hebrew author is trying to get through to this first century church who's struggling with the idea it's too hot in here. It, a persecution, it's just too hard. It's just too difficult. And I just, it would just be better for our family, for our way of life, for our safety, just to go back to the Jewish law when we were taking animals to the temple and we were sacrificing them. It's just better. And the Hebrew author is saying, no. Because it, it, it's not final. It's not eternal. If you have your Bibles with me, look at Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1. We're just going to go through four verses. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in, in, in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Through him also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father or the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Pray with me. Father God, open our hearts tonight, today to hear from you. In your name, amen. A few years ago, I received a present. I'm not for sure exactly what it was. I believe it was a uh, birthday present, and in it there was a card, a birthday card, but in the birthday card was another little card. And some of you have gone to novelty shops or the like and have seen these little cards with your name on it. Coca-Cola is doing that. Anybody with me there? You know, you go buy Coke and, hey, look, my name's on it. I've yet to find mine, but I'm a little unique there. But th there was this little card in it that had my name on it. This person had bought me this gift, and it was a card with my name, but it also had the roots of my name or the meaning of my name. And in it it said, Derek, from the English Scottish region, and it means. Hold on, let me get the let me get the thing here. It means. Hold on, where are we at? Prince or ruler of people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just wanted to point that out so you would know how to address me from here on out as Your Majesty, Most Holy Pastor. <laughs> Now, you know, when I got that, I had to show that to my wife, Tammy, right? I had to show that to her and say, hey, Tammy, uh, just in case you were wondering who you need to follow here, uh, just know that I'm the prince, the ruler of people, and you can just kiss my ring now. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out very well. But what, what was funny about that is, is that one day, not too long after that, Someone had done the same thing for Tammy. And Tammy got a card. And on it, it gave, it gave hers, and it said, Tammy from the Hebrew. Ooh, that means it's biblical. The Hebrew, the Old Testament language. Meaning, perfect one. <laughs> And so I had to live with that. <laughs> and so she threw it right back in my face <laughs> and said, you might be a ruler, but I'm perfect. Just remember that one. I say all that to say this. What's, what's in a name? 
You know, some people hate their name. Some people love their name. Some people get upset if you mispronounce their name. Anybody there know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Many names are famous, and just by their mention, images start to come up, right? Like Donald Trump, Walt Disney, Oscar Meyer. And what is true about all of these names, and our name as well, is the fact that none of us had a say to what we were going to be called or to how we were going to be named. Unless you went to court and changed your name, you're stuck with the name that your parents gave you, right? This is true of everyone except, except, except Jesus. He, you see, he had the choice and, and determination, or he, he could determine who he was going to be born to. And if you recall the angel that came to Mary, she, uh, the angel even said to Mary, you are to call him Jesus, for he will save his people. In our text this morning, we're going to learn that the name that Jesus was given is more superior than any other name around. And this morning we're going to get three quick reasons why this name is superior. Okay? You with me? You ready to go? Here we go. Number one. Reason number one, the name is superior because of who he is. We see in verse 1 and 2, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets and many portions, these days he has spoken to us in his Son. In other words, his name is superior because he's God's Son. Are you following me? He's not merely a man appointed by God like all the other prophets of the Old Testament or all the other prophets that have come before him and some maybe even after. He's different because he is the Son of God. You see, when you're a son, you receive benefits and blessings that only come from being the child of your father. Right? Right? Does anybody remember? Anybody remember uh, a few years back um, when? Well, this was way back. JFK uh, became president, and that famous picture that was him at his desk, and you saw his son, little John John, going through the legs of him and down around the desk. I think I got a picture up there. Yeah. John Jr. or John John. Um, was born 16, at, 16 days after his father was elected to the presidency. And after that, he spent his entire life in the spotlight. But if you recall, in 1999, uh, John John was killed, along with his wife Carolyn and sister-in-law Lauren, when their plane that he was piloting went down in the Atlantic Ocean off Martha's Vineyard. The NTSB determined that the probable cause of crash was pilot error. You see, Kennedy wasn't uh, uh, instrument qualified, and he got disoriented, and he inverted the plane, and every time he pulled up, he was actually going closer and closer to the ground, and he wasn't trusting his instruments. He was trusting his feelings, and he literally just flew himself right into the ocean, and, and he perished. But I tell that story because of the aftermath. Does everybody remember when we were trying to figure out what happened to John Jr.? And his plane went up and it didn't land. And, and there was this huge, massive search. And the news stations were all over trying to figure out in boats. Navy ships were out there. And, and they were looking for days. And a lot of resources Time and money and military effort was put into trying to find his plane. There became a debate during this time, if you recall, that 
why are we spending so much money and resources over someone who never held any public office or military and all this money is being spent? You see, had he been born John F. Smith and his father had not been president, no doubt they wouldn't have done all that they did to try and find his remains. The point I, I tell you this story, or the reason I tell you this story, is that it matters who Jesus' dad is. He's the son of God. He's an heir to the blessings and the fortunes of all of what God has. All the Father has is He's the rightful inheritor. He is the prince. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Now we call him the King of Kings, and he is, and Lord of Lords. But uh, furthermore, the text begins with God speaking through the prophets in many portions and in many ways, meaning that they were given a piece of the puzzle, but not a complete picture in its totality of what God was doing through their, his son. So in addition, we not only see that his name is superior because he is the son, but also because of what we see here, he is God. Come on, church. Jesus is God. Amen? Are you with me here? There's some religious teachings that don't teach this. They have some issues with Jesus. They believe he's a good teacher, maybe a nice prophet. But this is saying Yeshua is Allah. Jesus is God. Okay? Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is Yahweh. Verse 3, he is the radiance of his glory. He is the exact representation of God's nature. He's the expressed image of his person. The brightness of his glory, that radiance. It speaks of, you might recall the Old Testament where it talks about the Shekinah glory that came down into the Holy of Holies. It's that glory that is expressed here. Jesus is that radiance. Christ is, I love this illustration, Christ is to the Father what the rays of the sun are to the sun. He's expressed image. Only Jesus could say in John 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, when you see Christ, you see the glory of God. I guess my question this morning as we look at this truth and try to apply it to our lives is, who is he to you? I know who he is to me. I have read what the apostles proclaimed him to be to them. I've spoke to other people on who he is to them. My question to you this morning is who is Jesus to you? Let me, let me explain something to you. How you answer that question how you choose to answer that question has eternal consequences and will determine how you live the rest of your life here on earth. It's the most important question you will ever ask or answer. So, his name is superior because of who he is, and secondly, it's superior because of what he has done. Verse 2 says, by whom also he made the worlds. You know, many people get confused and they think when they open up the uh, Genesis and they see the creation account, they just assume that it's God the Father 
that's doing the work, that's making the heavens and the earth. However, in Colossians 1, we see a different understanding. For by him, by Christ, all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or rulers or authorities. Follow me. All things have been created through Christ and for Christ. All things. Everything that was created, both visible and invisible, both in heaven and on earth, everything was created through Christ. Verse 4 says, Heaven become as much better than the angels. He has an inherited a more excellent name than they. The Son is greater than what He created, just like the builder is better than what He built. Doesn't it just stand to reason? Hebrews 3, 3 and 4 says, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. So not only is his name superior because he was the creator of all things, but also because he's the architect. He's the founder of it all. He's the founder of salvation. We have salvation because he's the author of salvation. It just didn't, hey, salvation just came about like osmosis or something. Christ developed he wrote it. He created salvation. We were in our sins. We had no hope. He says, I have an answer. I'm writing it down. I'm becoming the living word. The living word's about to become flesh. And I'm going to be the author of your salvation. This is why he has the name that is better than any other name. Look at Philippians 2, 8 through 10. It says this, Being found in the appearance of his man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That at the name of Jesus so, his name is greater because of who he is. His name is greater because of who he, what he has done. And lastly, thirdly, his name is greater because of what he continues to do. What he continues to do. Not only did Christ create all things by his word, but he also holds all things together by that same powerful word. He upholds, verse 3 tells us, Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. In other words, Jesus is the hand at the wheel. He just didn't, like a clock, wind it up like the deists believe and set it down and just, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Uh, we're just, it, the clock is moving. Whatever happens, happens. No. Jesus is at the wheel. He's in control. He's in charge. He's steering this thing where he wants to go. He's still to this day holding everything together. And as we apply that, let me just say this. Jesus is still at work. Even though we see he, he did his work, he went and sat at the right hand of the Father, he's still interceding for us to this day. And since Jesus is still working, he's asking you and I to do the same, to still work, to still move. There's still work to be done. There's still souls to be saved. There's still people that need to hear the name. I conclude with this thought. What, what does the name mean for us? At this point, you might be thinking that, I, of course, I'm referring to Jesus. Um, but that's only partially correct. 
Jesus is only his first name. The more excellent name that Jesus possesses is what we talked about just earlier. Son of God. While the angels collectively may be termed sons of God, no angel would be given the title individually. It belongs uniquely to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalms it says, Today thou art my Father, this day I have begotten you. John 17 says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may be glorified in you. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. The resur- Follow me. The resurrection declares that Jesus is God's Son. It shows us that he is the promise. He is the seal of our salvation. Romans 1 4 says, Who through the Spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you remember the question I asked when we were talking about John Jr.? Why did they spend so much money? Why did they spend so much money? Why did they spend so much resources? The reason was because of two little letters, that J and that R. He was John F. Kennedy, Jr. What does that have to do with us? Romans 8, 17 tells us. If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. In other words, the joy, and you've heard me say this many times, and I, I think I'm like Bob, I want to say it several times so we can get, we can get it in our head here. You are children of God. You are sons of God. You are daughters of God. And as a result of that fact, you have the same promises that Jesus Christ received from his heavenly Father. So in the same way that on that day, on first Easter Sunday, when God said, Rise, and his son had life again, on the day that he calls you home, and you close your eyes in this life, on that day, if you are a child of God, he will raise you up to live and to be with him in all of eternity. The same promises that he gave to Jesus, he's giving to you. If that doesn't get you excited, if that doesn't make you joy-filled, if that doesn't allow you to go through the hardships of this life, even when people persecute you, I don't know what will. It's that promise that should get your life to change. You should no longer be different, or you should no longer be the same. You should be different. You should be following Him with love, joy, peace, patience, that fruit of the Spirit, that excitement, in your life, knowing that you are not just that last name that your earthly dad gave you. And it might be a good name. It might be a Trump name. It might be a Disney name. But in the end, that name is not the best name. That name is not the name that you need to get into heaven. The name that is greater than all. And what will happen when you stand at those gates and say, can I enter or not, or will you enter, you won't even see him if you're you're not, is whether or not you're a son or daughter of the high king of heaven. Whether or not he'll look at you and say, son, daughter, child. 
Come, enter in, for great is your reward. There's no other gate. There's no other way. Jesus became sin so that you and I could become children of the King. So that you and I could be adopted into an inheritance that would never fade or perish or spoil. That should just overwhelm you. I close with this story. There's a years ago, and I, I don't. They've, they've made so many of them that I don't really know which one it is. Anybody remember those chicken soup for the soul books? Years ago, I was reading a story of um, uh, in one of them. I'm not for sure which one it was, but it told the story of a young boy who grew up in a small Tennessee town, and he grew up in one of those small small towns you might know of, you know those small towns where everybody knows what everybody had for breakfast, you know, where you can't get away with anything. I mean, that dirty laundry's out everywhere, you know, and if it's not, somebody will get it out. (laughs) I mean, you live in those small towns where everybody knows everybody's business, and this young boy was born to his mother, and no one knew, no one knew the boy's father. And sometimes people can be pretty cruel and say things in earshot of a young boy who's trying to grow up and to establish his identity to where he can hear those questions and then begin to doubt and begin to uh, just have self-conscious issues. And so this boy pretty much grew up with, I'm going to stay away from people. But then a new minister came to town at the church there, and a lot of people were talking to him and saying, or, or he was hearing people talk and say, hey, you need to come to this church. It's really, it's really interesting. It's wonderful. And one day he, he built up the courage to go and attend the church. And he'd come late. He'd come in when everybody was already seated or in the midst of worship. And he'd come and he'd sit at the end or in the back pew. And then... By the time uh, the pastor finished, he had already made his way out the exit so as to not be seen by many people. And he got excited about the pastor and the sermons and the services, and he started to stay. And then one Sunday, the dreadful thing happened. He was sitting there. And he got enthralled in the prayer, in the closing prayer that the pastor was praying. And he forgot to leave. And as he said amen, the people filled the aisles and, and fellowship began, kind of what we do here. And he, and he tried to make his way out of the church without being seen or without being talked to. And all of a sudden, the boy felt this tug on his shirt, and as this person turned him around, he caught the glimpse of this chin with this beard, and he realized it was the pastor. And the pastor looked at him and he said, Hey there, young fella. Well, who's your father? And you just heard this silence, and you heard some whispers from other people within the church because they knew that they didn't, no one knew who his father was. And the boy's heart began to sink. And he thought, I'm going to be disappointed again. Here another person is going to reject me. But before he could could get that thought even completed, the pastor got down to eye level. And he looked at him and he said, you know, the resemblance is striking. You're a son of the Father in heaven. Look at you. You're beautiful. Hey, go and live a life that's following God, your Father. And with that, his heart just elevated. And he skipped out of that church with a new understanding that he was not just some unknown fatherless kid, but he was a child of the king. He was a child 
of God. That boy was Ben W. Hooper. And later, he became the governor of the state of Tennessee from 1911 to 1915. When you understand your identity in Christ, you can live a life that can overcome obstacles and self-consciousness. And you can know that no matter what goes on, you're a child of the King. Amen? Amen. You don't have to go through the love. You don't have to go through life fatherless. God says, I'm going to be a father to the fatherless. The resemblance is uncanny, church. You're a child of the King. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing over each one here.